Take your Bibles and look with me at Luke chapter 11. We are, of course, in a study with Christ in the school of prayer, and he's teaching his people as he answers the question given by this disciple who had been with him. Of course, it, to be with Jesus was to watch prayer in action, to, to hear the, the things that we ought to pray, and to see the passion with which he followed up his prayers, <laughs> to watch him, to see his countenance, to listen to what he prayed was to touch heaven, really. It was to hear from one who communed with his heavenly Father and met needs and thought about needs and expressed his heart and was vulnerable and, and open and there was such a free flow of life and spiritual nutrient from the sustaining power of the Spirit of God and he longed for it, Jesus did, and he, he loved it and he went after it. And the disciples watched it and so there was growing in them an appetite for it and a longing for it to pray as they ought to pray and to pray as they'd seen their Lord pray. So a disciple came, as you remember, and he said, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us. Not teach us a, something to recite, not, not teach us something to memorize so that we can then recite it in some sort of orthodox, traditional way, although it wouldn't be sinful as we saw last time, but, but teach us how. Teach us its content. Teach us prayer's themes. Teach us where our heart's supposed to be, our mind's supposed to be. Give us a framework through which we learn to pray and frame it up in these overarching themes that become sort of the general categories of our content, the things we think about, the lines we trace through these wonderful themes then become for us a pattern. We're to learn how to weave them into the fabric of our communion with God. This is, this is what Jesus did here. They're indelible. And as we began to see last time, we could say that they're all redemptive. You could frame the prayer that Jesus gave here and, and the, the pattern, and you could do the same with what he said at the hillside in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel. You could, you could frame it up a number of ways, but wonderful for our purposes here is this, this great theme of redemption. Prayer is all about redemptive themes. Prayer is all about praying what is on God's heart, and what's on God's heart is redemption. You can see it in every line of what Jesus gives to the disciple here. He said, this is how I want you to pray. I want you to say, Father. Why? Because God has redeemed us. The Father has redeemed us. He's adopted us. He's given us full privileges of belonging to his family. What a sweet reminder even of today on Father's Day that we have our ultimate expression of oversight and protection and care and and admonishment, and love, and coming alongside from our Heavenly Father. And He has adopted us. He redeemed us. He pulled us in. He privileged us with the, with the joys of family and belonging. And then Jesus said, hallowed be your name. Of course. He's set apart. He is holy. And there's a gap. There's a chasm there that only redemption can bridge. And so even in saying, hallowed be your name, we are reminded of the deliverance from sin and the bridging of that chasm. And so we're delivered from our self-worship and we can worship Him. We're delivered from a heart of fear of judgment and we come to Him in reverence and adore Him. This is what it means to then move your prayer through the theme and content of worship. Your kingdom come. That's right. We anticipate the summing up of all things in our Redeemer. Promised before time began, Titus 1, 2 says. God who cannot lie, before time began, before the universe was made, in the councils of the Trinity, promised. He covenanted. And he cannot lie that he would bring a redeemed people. Give us each day our daily bread. God is to be trusted because he's our heavenly father. He's, he supplies all our needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. There's a redemptive theme even in every line here. Forgive us our sins. That's right. That's the bullseye of God's glory. That's the display of all of his perfections in all their glory. The forgiving love of God. The mercy of God. The, the mercy toward enemies. The power to save. And a Savior who's a substitute 
to atone for my sin. You see redemption all through this wonderful communion with God. The beauty and glory of our walk with God and our prayers to Him, they're painted on a canvas of red. Huh? They're painted in the colors of redemption and it just spills out all over this prayer. I want to remind you, however, that Jesus doesn't talk about some things here and it's just important to remember this from a practical standpoint. We know what he doesn't talk about. He doesn't prescribe a particular place or time for prayer. He doesn't prescribe a schedule. In the Old Testament, patriarchs set patterns of communing with God on a variety of sort of fronts with time and schedule and place. They had set times like Daniel in Daniel 6 verse 10, three times a day. They had unscheduled times when a need arose, as you see Paul admonish us in Philippians 4. Uh, you prayed when you were fully satisfied. You prayed when you had need. You prayed when a temptation came. You prayed in a season of rest from the battle. You prayed in the morning at midday or before bed. You, you even prayed in a constant spirit of dependence. Jesus also doesn't give us any particular posture of prayer. I mean, we do, we do all kinds of traditional things. There's nothing sinful about any of it necessarily as long as the heart is right. But, but all kinds of things happen in the New Testament and in the Old Testament patriarchy. There, there are all kinds of ways they prayed. Sometimes it was in anguish with their face to the ground with ashes and dust. Sometimes it was lifting their eyes up to represent people as Jesus did in John 17. And he put his hands out to say, Father, I'm presenting these people to you. Sometimes it's as was admonished in the New Testament that I want all men everywhere, Paul says, to lift up holy hands. Sometimes it's a confessional gesture. I want you to look at my palms. Is there any sin on my hands that, that I'm guilty for and need to confess? Sometimes it's like we do often. We want no distraction, so we close our eyes. We, we want to gesture some reverence, and so we bow our heads in humility Sometimes it was kneeling as Solomon in 1 Kings 8, sometimes laying on the ground face down as Ezra 9, 5 says. Jesus doesn't talk about place, he doesn't talk about time, he doesn't talk about posture, he also doesn't talk about length. Paul had specific lists he would go through as his epistles indicate, like 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, where he says, I remember you always in my prayers, always making mention. He's got lists and systematic ways that he prayed. We do that, church lists, and, and you, you have them at home, and you have reminders on your dashboard, and, and we have lists in the back of the church, and we pass that stuff around, and you have to think about that and pray for those things, and you mark it down, and then there is also in that same letter, ironically, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, there's this unceasing prayer that goes on. You can pray anytime, any place. Sometimes privacy and quiet is needed. Sometimes public prayer is fitting. You can be standing, you can be sitting, you can be kneeling, you can be laying down, looking up, looking down. You can even gesture in unity by holding hands with one another. No, that's not creepy. It's a gesture. Solidarity, unity. Unity. Meeting needs. You can cry out in agony and sorrow. You can express joy and gratitude. You can commune with God in short bursts or longer, sometimes even planned petitions. When Jesus gives us this pattern here, it is, it is to say there's a thematic undercurrent that your mind works through on a regular basis the more your prayers mature. And this pervades your prayers. And these themes, by the way, hem us in. They pull us out of ourselves. They shape our perspective. They hold us accountable. They set our hearts and minds on the truth. Most of all, they keep us from letting our flesh drag our prayers into the mundane and the profane, which sometimes happens. Right after you've expressed a wonderful thought, rich in worship, entering into your mind on the heels of it is something mundane or distracting and sometimes even sinful. And these themes focus us. There are five redemptive themes here in the prayer here. The first we saw last time, worship. When you pray, say, Father. What does this speak of? There's intimacy here. There's not a single barrier. 
And there is transparency here. There's not a single secret. And there is security here. It should course through your mind when you pray. There's not a single fear you bring. Fear of the world, fear to give to him, fear to lay at his feet, but not fear of him. There's no barrier, no secrets, no fear of judgment. It's just the worship of the sweet communion of an intimate fellowship with God. And then we saw last time as well in this worship that it is reverence. Hallowed be your name. To commune with God is to adore him. To commune with God is to say, vindicate your name. Separate yourself out. Don't let me drag you down to to make you look like me or feel like me or do things my way. You be who you are in my mind and my heart. Vindicate yourself. You're not on trial in my life. Hallowed be your name. That leads then so wonderfully into lordship. The first redemptive theme is worship, and the second is lordship. Notice the end of verse 2. He'd said, Father. He'd said, Hallowed be your name. And then he said, Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Matthew records that on the hillside, Jesus said, Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus just packs it all into this one simple phrase, your kingdom come. This is where the prayer moves from worship to an explicit call for God's sovereignty to be on your heart and mind. God is sovereign. He is ruler. And everything he's planned and every way in which he's planning to rule, everything he's ordained about his rule is on your heart and mind. The Lord teaches us here that when we pray, our requests ought to include the expressed desire to see the sovereign rule of God in the person of Jesus Christ, particularly his return. The return of Christ to set up his glorious eternal kingdom and all that comes with it. This is a a prayer for the supreme lordship of Christ over his people, that he's Lord in his church, that he's Lord over our hearts, that he's Lord over all. And it's a prayer for his enemies to drop to their knees. Even if not genuine worship as it relates to the believer who genuinely worships God in spirit and truth. But even an enemy bowing the knee because he must. He has a sovereign creator, a Lord of his life, a judge of his rebellion. That's what you're praying for. We could look at it this way. The undercurrent of our prayers should be ever moving toward what is to come. It should not be staying around what is here. It should not be focused on everything that is here. We bring everything that's here, but it should not then stay there. It should move toward what is to come. It's where our minds should go. In your prayer life, there should, as you mature, be this movement from current burdens to the time when there will be no more burdens. Your prayers should move from present needs to the time when we are abundantly and eternally supplied by God in all of our needs. That should be the trajectory of your prayer life as it matures. You should go from the tragedies and tears of today to the time when he'll wipe away all of our tears. Your prayers move from the constant reminders of our broken down bodies and inevitable death to the day when we put on immortality. The day when a new body is fashioned for glory to match our redeemed heart. Is that your prayer life? Is that where it goes? Is that what it moves toward? Is that what most excites you? Is that an exclamation point that's increasingly becoming a part of what you express to God? Where you move from being in the midst of this world's darkness to the time when all that darkness is swallowed up by the eternal light of Christ and you long for it and it begins to permeate as an aroma what you say Listen, beloved, if in our waking hours we're called to always set our mind on things above and not on things of the earth, right? Colossians 3. If in our waking hours, through the day, we're to detach, take our grip off of what is here and promote 
what is in heaven, where Christ is, where we're seated with him. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, and we're in Christ. If we're throughout the day to promote that, then how can it be that our prayers do not reflect the same movement, the same trajectory? This is to be the saturating mindset of all that we do every day, and it's to permeate It is to permeate what we talk to God about, the righteous reign of God throughout the whole earth. It's coming. He's promised it. It will happen. And we can't be talking with the God of the eternal future and have our prayers not be an anticipation of the eternal future. It makes no sense. As I said, Jesus is teaching a pattern. And here right up front in the prayer, the sovereignty of God shows up and the Lord brings in the expression of longing for his rule. An implication of this principle, to long for God's rule, an implication of it is that if your prayers are only centered around what is current and temporal and there's no expression of longing for what is to come and what is eternal, then the emphasis of your prayer life is not what yet what it ought to be. It's not yet mature. Don't think your prayers are mature just because you can go through lists and lists of all the things you need here. And God wants you to do that. And it's well and good. I mean, you know what our prayer sheets sometimes have on them. Look at the prayer sheet. Look at your list. It has all the wonderful things we're to share with God openly and freely. He wants to hear it all. But quite often, the time sharing in our prayers is lopsided. Sometimes we're so much about safe travel and adequate rest and renewed health and Aunt Matilda's bunion. We're so much about physical infirmities here, which we ought to bring. But have our prayers missed the kingdom issue, the maturing of saints, what Christ has as his ultimate goal, what's on his mind for your day, discernment for the person sitting next to you so that they don't get caught up in sin. Father, keep loved ones from false doctrine. Keep my loved ones from the hospital? Of course I would love that. But keep them from false doctrine. And bring stability to my marriage, to my family, spiritual stability. Lord, prepare us today for persecution. Bring strength. Do you pray that? Lord, make the growth exponential for the friend who seems to incessantly fall into the same sin. Let me help the weak. Let me encourage the faint-hearted. Give me courage to admonish the weak. Father, give us conviction over sin so that repentance is real. Give us a fresh passion and understanding of Christ and his work of redemption that our prayer life puts an automatic exclamation point that involves the coming kingdom and the spiritual pursuits that are of greatest interest to Christ. That's what you're doing when you pray, your kingdom come. It's simple, but jam-packed. We have this amazing access to the sovereign God of the universe and he does delight in our communion (laughs) and he's promised that if we will come to him, he longs to hear us unburden our hearts to him and he wants to hear it all. And of course, if you come in faith, it is free open access. Don't, Don't believe you can come to God and just dump it all on him while you're allowing sin to fester in your heart. Let him deal with your sin, but don't allow it to fester. Don't you dare pray and get up from that and hang on to sins and bitterness. Don't rush into his presence flippantly. Suddenly, yes. Immediately, yes. Painfully, yes, but not flippantly. And don't be arrogant and don't be irreverent and never level suspicion at God. But if you come in faith, as James 1, 5, and 6 says, if you ask God in faith, he gives to all men generously. He wants to hear it all. But having told us to tell him all, 
He wants the permeation of the fullest expression of his glory to, to be the aroma of our prayers. Lord, I want the fullest expression of your glory. Whatever's happening here, if it brings you glory, let it happen. Lord, whatever needs to happen to be the fullest expression of your perfections, whatever will magnify your character in all eternity, whatever that means for me in my life today or tomorrow or the rest of it, your kingdom come. Lord, make it happen. Cost to me what? If that's what's going to come, oh, the cost here is nothing. He sent us out proclaiming the kingdom of God. Why? That's our trajectory. You know, we have so much ministry talk about gospel-centeredness and outreach and reaching the community and reaching the city. I'll tell you what. You want to know how gospel-centered you are? Listen to your own prayer life. Is it all about comforts here? Of course we want comforts. Of course God says, bring your needs to me. Of course we're feeble and we lay it on the line sometimes with the thinnest emotional thread. Of course. But are we really gospel-centered? Do we say your kingdom come? What does it mean to pray your kingdom come? Here's a few thoughts. First of all, when you say your kingdom come, it means you want the return of Christ. You want it. You want it at his Beckoning, you want it at his purpose, you want it in all of its fullness, and you joyfully anticipate it. You're not trying to buy up and get all you can here. You're not sitting here saying, boy, you know, I want Jesus to return, but not yet. So many things I want to enjoy here. Oh, listen. I hath not seen nor ear heard, nor has it ever entered into the heart of man all that God has prepared for those who love him. And if you knew that, you would not set aside the Lord of glory or his kingdom or his ordained time frame for some cheap trinket here. You wouldn't do it. It's not that you don't serve him here. It's not that you don't enjoy the graces here. You enjoy them. They're just not it for you. They're nothing for you. They're they're dispensable. You can set them on the altar of the anticipation of the return of the king. When you say your kingdom come, you're saying whenever, however, in whatever timing, and, and if all of my earthly goods are gone in a moment when you come, it's not a moment too soon for me. Is that what you pray? Here's what else you're praying when you say your kingdom come. You're praying that the divine wrath of Almighty God would fall for His character's sake. It means you have a pure heart and a pure mind and you want God's purity upheld. You don't want His grace to not fall on souls. Of course, when you look at the souls of men, you just are in agony that God would intervene and save them before it's too late. But you know that when judgment falls, The glory of God, the blazing holiness of God will silence all of us. Just as it says in the Old Testament in Habakkuk when it said the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. That's right. When God's glory fills the earth and judgment falls, all will be silent. And when you say your kingdom come, you're saying, Lord, I want souls saved. But when you've chosen and when the hammer falls, I am on your side, I am for your glory, and I'm praying it right now in my prayer life. Vindicate your holiness. Make all things right. Don't be offended one more second, oh God, by me or anybody else. You're also praying this. You're praying that the reign of Christ over his people would be at its fullest expression. That means to say his will. 
This is why Matthew records that Jesus said, your kingdom come, your will be done. You're saying, Lord, reign. And that means in your prayer life, you're saying, reign over my life and my will. Right now, my will. All will. The will of all creatures. The earth, the universe, the will of angels. Rule it. Reign over it in its fullest expression. And let no one rebel against your will. Your will is perfect. Your will is sweet. Your will is lovely. Your will is never wrong. Your will is glorious. Your will is eternal. To say your kingdom come is to say, Lord, I want you to reign in your rightful place eternally over the kingdom of priests, your people. And having said that, you are, you are praying, Lord, I want your will to be perfectly obeyed perfectly obeyed. And in the perfect obedience of all creatures to God's will, whether they do it by, by judgment or whether they do it by redemption, that then fills the earth and the universe with glory and righteousness. It was promised in Isaiah 24, 23. It was promised in Zechariah 14, 9 that the glory of God would fill the earth. When you say your kingdom come, that's what you're praying. Fill the earth with your glory. How does that happen? By all wills being brought into subjection to your will. And this changes your prayer, doesn't it? Man, it is working humility in your heart because the Spirit of God, while you're praying that, is bringing up all kinds of self-will, all kinds of personal will. And you're being called right then and there to say the opposite. I don't want my will. I want your will. That's what you're praying. When Jesus said he was the fulfillment of the kingdom, it was just the inauguration. He would come and he would save. And in saving, he's gathering a kingdom of priests. And the kingdom of God was near them in the sense that the Savior was there on the earth and he was doing his redemptive work. And he ascended to heaven and now is at the right hand of the Father. So everything's been inaugurated. Everything has been begun. The kingdom power is now on display in the saving of sinners and redeeming them. But the ultimate kingdom is yet to come. And when you pray, man, your will is now out in the open. When you say your kingdom come, your will is out in the open to be dealt with. That'll change your prayer life for sure. You're saying magnify your sovereignty, vindicate your holy name, bring judgment against all who reject you, take up your rightful throne and reign in glory. You're saying, God, for, reverse the curse, reverse it. This curse of sin, make all things new. Save the lost. Preserve your people. Conform them to Christ. Increase their influence. But it's a little closer to home when you pray this. It'd be enough to pray that and have your will out in the open to be dealt with, but when you say your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, you're talking about the fact that you have the Spirit right now and heaven has come down in believers by the Spirit of God and in redemption. So what does that mean for your prayer life now? It starts to get really close to our hearts and close to home here, beloved. If you're going to pray this wonderful theme, and you must, you must think about it, it must become a part of the maturing of your prayer life. But when you say your kingdom come, you're saying some things that get really close to home. First of all, you're saying, oh God, I want your word, which is your will, exalted in my heart and my life. If your will is to be done, I want the exaltation of your word, which is your will, in my life. Exalt your word in my heart and in my life. 
It is not equal with anything else. It is not set among all kinds of other activities of your life. It is not set among other ideologies and philosophies. It is not an equal with other ideas and opinions that you might have. It is the word of Almighty God, the will of Almighty God. And to say your kingdom come is to pray that your heart would want his will exalted, which means you want his word. How can you say you hunger for God's word and then not pray this? Or say it in the reverse. How could you pray this and not hunger? To know his will. You say, well, pastor, we're limited. We can't can't always hunger at the highest level. Of course. And you'll see next time when we see the leadership of our Lord and Savior, you'll see that he supplies our needs, including the Spirit. We must run to him. In running to him, though, you say your kingdom come. You're saying, I want your will which means I want your word exalted in my heart so that I may say, your will, not mine, O Lord. You're also praying this. I want to love your commands. I don't just want them. I want to love them. I want to love them like I love you, O God. I want to love them like I love the cross and your work on the cross. I want to love them beyond anything else in my life that I feel or experience and I call love. Oh, how I love your commands, your law, Psalm 119.97. And then you're also praying not only that the will of God would be exalted in your life through his word, but that you love his commands and that you may understand the truth deeply and see its implications. Look, not only do I want to love your word so that I go to it, it's my go-to, it's my daily food, but I want to see its implications. When I read the word, I want it to come off the pages with a deeper understanding and a conviction as I see the implications. I see its exposing of my idolatries. I see it confronting my worldview I see it coming against my self-will. I see it breaking my heart over my weakness. I see it showing me truth and helping me identify that which is not truth. I want to see its implications. Your kingdom come means, Lord, show me your will and show me its implications so that the expressions of your kingdom afforded me today by the Spirit of God can actually be on earth. Your will be done on earth through me. You're also praying that your faith would grow and strengthen. Well, that means that when you pray your kingdom come, God wants to, he wants to minister in your life by the power of his spirit so that kingdom power is on display through your life. And in doing so, he's going to have to stretch your faith and grow your faith. You're going to have to believe God. And he's rooting out unbelief and weaning you from the things that get in the way. And he's growing you strong in faith so that your spiritual senses are trained to quickly distinguish truth from lies. That's what you're praying. You're praying, may I humbly tremble at your voice, O God. And may I not dispute what you say with any argument. May I just seek to understand what you say. May I just seek to open my heart to it, lay lay it all on the altar with what you say. If you tell me what your will is, I want your kingdom to come, so I want your will to be done. And if by the Spirit your will can be done right now through me, right in this moment... Let nothing get in the way. Which means you're also praying, Lord, keep me from three things, spiritual laziness, spiritual arrogance, and and unbelief. Keep me from neglect. Keep me from imagining I know better. And keep me from doubt in your character. And you're praying, fill me with Christ-likeness 
so that as he is holy, I'm learning to be holy. You see, beloved, when you pray your kingdom come, everything then starts to take shape around this idea of the reign and sovereign work of Christ, the will of Christ, his purposes, what he wants. And your own will is put on the front. It's put on the front line. It's laid on the line. It's out there exposed so that you can see the truth, understand the truth, see the implications of it, and you can begin to see this work of humility happen as you verbalize and as you believe and as you lay your heart before those words, your kingdom come in all of its glory. And if it has these implications in my life, yes, that's what I want. It should permeate your prayers. Your heart will easily progress to the overwhelming sense of your need if you pray like this. Because to say your will be done is to immediately recognize how often is not done in my life. And so suddenly there's a work of dependence that is beginning to to occur, and Jesus knew that. He knew that if you prayed in a spirit of worship, Father, I'm your child, hallowed be your name, vindicate yourself, your mind would go immediately to sovereignty, and as it goes to sovereignty, it goes to the Lordship of Christ, and you will be praying, your kingdom come, your will be done. Whatever it takes in my life, whatever it means for me, show me your will, and then let that begin to stir up my need as I compare your will with my own behavior and my own heart, and and dependence begins to nurture. And that smoldering flame of dependence becomes a fire of faith in you, and you go to God, as Jesus illustrates here, and you say, Okay, meet my needs. Give me my day-by-day need for bread. And you move from the lordship of Christ to his leadership in your life. And we'll, we'll unfold this next week, but I can't resist what it says at the first line, the first two words, give us. That means I haven't any resources in and of myself. I don't give it to me. I don't crank it up. And as we study this next week, we're going to see how often we imagine different just from our daily life. How does our daily life contribute to the sense of taking for granted the reality? I have no resources. God has them all. But there it is. You go from the sovereignty and the will of God to the great awareness of your need and then you say to him, you got to give me. You got to give it to me. I I don't have it. I'm bankrupt without you. This This is the sweetness of what Jesus was saying to the disciple when he said, teach us to pray. And Jesus said, here's how I want you to pray. And every time they would look back on it. And here we are 2,000 years later looking back on it, his very words. And it is just sort of exploding out in front of us as a mandate and pattern and rich expressional framework of prayer. How can we do this? Because we've been redeemed. And while we're here, before we arrive there, he says, talk to me. Commune with me about your redemption. Tell me. Tell me what you believe. Tell me what you love. Tell me what you know. Tell me what you need. And woven through all of it, extol my glory, honor my sovereignty, follow my will, and ask me, leadership for next time. Actually, all three next time, because then we got to take a little break in the pulpit, but so pray for me, three of them next time. Wow. (laughs) Wow. All right. Our Heavenly Father, our gracious Lord and Master, Jesus Christ, 
by your Spirit, you teach us. And there is in so many ways a divine storehouse wrapped up in every term that you gave that day. It's an economy of words and the brilliance and genius of your Spirit, but the more we study it, the more we plumb its depths, the more we look at it from every angle, the more we ponder it every way that you teach and instruct about prayer begins to come forth in our hearts and minds. It is specific to us, tailor-made for each one of us as your Spirit convicts. And already we're drawn to you again. Drawn to commune with you in this way. For when we get up from a planned time of prayer or when we come out of a spontaneous prayer cried out in the course of the day, whether we're on our knees or standing, if these have been the thematic flavorings of all that we express and we begin to mature in them and we don't forget them or neglect them, we know that we will have a renewed mind and a vigorous faith and we'll stand steadfast and we'll face what's to come and we'll see right from wrong and we'll know our walk with you and we'll sense the intimate protection and love. We will know it. We'll be useful, far more useful. Lord, we can already tell we've neglected these things in our prayer life and we've suffered for it. We've suffered for it. Our perspective is wrong. We, we're easily duped by error, and our will is in the way so often. Oh, God, please forgive us. And teach us to pray. For it's in your gr gracious and wonderful, marvelous name that we study this and lay it before you. Amen.